well, I'm Armand Volkas. I'm a psychotherapist, drama therapist, and a theater director based in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm an associate professor, or adjunct associate professor, in the uh, drama therapy program at the CIS. I am clinical director of the Living Arts Counseling Center in Emeryville. Uh, I also direct the Living Arts Playback Theater Ensemble, which uh, I've been doing for the last 30 years. Um, and also I'm the um, director, creator of, of uh, the drama therapy approach that I call Healing the Wounds of History, uh, working with the intercultural conflict transformation and healing uh, collective uh, and uh, historical trauma. Well, uh, let me just go through uh, briefly my history with uh, incarcerated people. I first started uh, working uh, with incarcerated people before I became a drama therapist. I was a, a theater person and actor, uh, MFA in acting from uh, UCLA. So in, um, in Los Angeles, um, I uh, worked at uh, Chino Men's Prison and also at California Institute uh, at Frontera with the, where the Manson women were incarcerated. Uh, they were there at the time that I was there. And this was uh, initially a project uh, that was sponsored uh, by uh, artists in prisons and other places. And uh, I was funded to go in to work uh, primarily at the women's prison and uh, to devise a theater piece which was performed for uh, the women. Uh, so it, was, it wasn't was performed for the public, but it was performed for the women themselves uh, performing in, a, in an assembly kind of way. I was invited by a public defender to uh, work with a man who had murdered a man, a woman, and an 18-month-old child with a, a knife. And it was a, a, a death penalty case. This was in 1986, 87. Um, and um, um, the public defender uh, was worried because it was it sounded it was such a heinous crime that um, they wanted to find ways to humanize him. They were going to put him on the stand. This was in the 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 pretrial phase, um, and uh, basically the public defender hired me as a drama therapist. He was very um, shy, if you could imagine. Uh, and, uh, but he was into Dungeons and Dragons. He was into role playing. And so uh, basically I, I worked with him. The first uh, goal was to help him testify kind of almost like an acting coach uh, to, so that he would feel comfortable uh, sharing what he, would, uh, what he would need to share. Uh, in a courtroom setting, um, but uh, ultimately the the public defender decided that it was um, that he wasn't going to put him on the stand. Uh, but meanwhile, I was working. With, I worked with him for close to a year. Where I would come two or three times a, a week and work with him, uh, doing individual drama therapy, and basically because he was uh, also into science fiction as well. Uh, we did a, a lot of, um, uh, we started to enact and co-create a science fiction novel. And it became very clear to me as uh, his uh, drama therapist that the characters uh, were, uh, he was working through his, uh, his guilt and shame uh, about his his deed, which was a um, a drug deal gone gone bad, 
and there was drug, drugs and alcohol were involved. Uh, he was uh, he was um, uh, the first murder it could have been seen as self-defense. The second one could also have been seen as self-defense. But after the baby was crying, he freaked out and he wanted to not call attention to the two people. And so he murdered the baby. In the, um, the enactments, um, um, the story was about uh, some, somebody in, in the future who uh, adopts a son, a child, saves a son um, uh, from, um, uh, it's, it's been many years now, uh, in any case, it's, it's a, the rescue of a, of a child and then he raises the child as his own. And uh, to make a long story short, you know, that uh, over the time, that we worked together. He worked through a lot of the, um, uh, well, how can you work, completely work through something like that? But he was working with his, with his, his guilt and his shame. Um, at one point, before we knew that he, we weren't going to put him on the stand, um, I, um, I felt like, well, he was going to have to talk about the, the murder. They would be asked about it. And so I went with him into the moment where uh, he committed the crime. You know, moment by moment, we, we went into it in a psychodramatic kind of way. Uh, so that, uh, that uh, he, he could understand and I could understand what were the mechanisms that uh, caused him to uh, to um, to make the choices he made? One of the themes that I work on in my work is about the potential perpetrator in all of us. And uh, at the time, I was developing my healing the wounds of history approach, and so I was also doing uh, working with him to to understand the the dehumanization process that uh, the steps what does a human being need to do in order to dehumanize someone enough in order to to kill them or uh, so i was asking a lot of big big questions so there's a parallel counter transference kind of thing happening for me i see there's a there's a exercise uh, that i call the map of uh, Subpersonalities, where at the center of a of a of a page, you write, uh, make a circle, and write me, and then you you draw all the roles, the roles uh, to size based on how large they are, inside of you, and you embody them and introduce them. So it's a it's a it's a technique I use uh, in individual uh, therapy sometimes. I mean, he showed, he developed a very uh, complex map of his personality, where on one side, uh, he was a thief and a drug addict, and he kind of owned these different roles. But then uh, they showed the other side, which was, he also showed the other side, a, a lover, a brother, a son. And, uh, you know, this was... Um, um, so in the end, um, the public defender did not put him on the stand, decided it was, uh, it was not a good idea. It, the question of whether he murdered these people or not was, uh, was already uh, a done deal. He didn't, there was not much to do there. But uh, this was a death penalty case and the jury needed to needed to um, decide whether this man would live or, or would die. Uh, I, we also submitted the, the map of his personality as evidence. I mean, for the jury, if you look at just, uh, just look at the crime, it was um, 
um, it was a heinous crime. Uh, and, they, and the jury could only see him as a monster. But the jury reported that it was my testimony that uh, um, saved his life, that was able to humanize him, to show the whole, uh, the, all of the dimensions of, uh, of his personality. And that, that he, he was a, ultimately they saw the wounded uh, kid inside of him. Um, so in any case, I mean, that's enough about, uh, about him. I, I, I just, um, but the question, I mean, there were a lot of the things that came up for me when I was uh, uh, doing this work. Because I saw, you know, a lot of other uh, public defenders I mean, some ethical issues, you know, as a, as a drama therapist working with uh, um, incarcerated people before their trial. A lot of time, mostly we meet people after their trial. But to be a participant, you know, uh, uh, before somebody is convicted, that uh, I started to get offers from other, other uh, attorneys and I saw that I, I could, uh, you know, I, I could make a living doing this if I wanted to, but I, it was just too, you know, the ethical issues started to come in, you know. At what point uh, am, I, am I helping someone who uh, is guilty, you know, get off? Uh, uh, with a light sentence or to be seen as not guilty. Can I help someone lie? Could I, um, could I work for the mafia, um, uh, uh, aiding them? And uh, I think it was so, uh, so complex. I, even though I saw that a lot of people were, were very, in a mercenary way, were using action uh, methods to uh, to help trial lawyers. I, I just uh, stopped uh, doing that. I met uh, uh, Zenada Kash at the um, NADTA conference in Montreal um, many years ago, and she invited me to uh, come to Lebanon. Uh, she had already created uh, her theater piece and her film about working in the, uh, the men's prison. Uh, but she was in the process of, um, of uh, developing a theater piece in the women's prison. And it was during this time that she was working there uh, in the, the women's prison that she and invited me not specifically to to intervene i mean there were a lot of other workshops i think i i brought playback theater to lebanon uh, i worked with uh with palestinians and uh and uh, christian lebanese in a, a palestinian refugee camp she set that up for me um, and uh, also did some healing the wounds of history work around the the civil war, the the, the Lebanese civil war, working with all the factions uh, involved. Um, but for about four, three or four times, I'm forgetting how many uh, times I went in there for um, uh, into the women's prison and and worked with the women who, if you've seen the film. Uh, uh, became part of the film, and they were in, still in the process of creation, creating it. And um, I developed some. Um, uh, I facilitated some processes uh, with the support of uh, of Zena and uh, other people who were part of the project, and uh, some some elements. Uh, of what we explored ended up in the piece. You know, I'd already worked, I'd worked in the women's prison in the United States, in California. Uh, you know, the, the act of me, an American, 
uh, and also um, as a, you know, I, I chose not to be out that I was also uh, Jewish. Uh, I decided that it was it would not be a, a good idea in Lebanon anyway to to uh, I, I was encouraged not to reveal that or uh, um, so here I was in in the heart of um, of uh, the prison and uh, uh, honored uh, being the only the only male besides the the guards. Um, you know, honored to um, to gain the trust of these women. Uh, it was a very profound experience, the, both the cross-cultural encounter, as well as uh, me ultimately uh, being seen as a as a safe man. So Zena's the Zena's project, and uh, it was an honor to be invited into the heart of, of her work. And uh, I, feel, I feel like I made a small uh, contribution to the to the piece. This is a one more intervention in in prison. Um, uh, in the San Francisco jail, there is the Man Alive project. I don't know if it's still in existence, but it was um, it was there was a program for um, uh, people who are incarcerated uh, for domestic violence. And uh, they were all part of a program. Uh, they would get a, a reduction of, of time um, of their sentence if they went through this program. And so um, I... I brought my playback theater company in. This was, uh, I'm forgetting the, the name of the program that, uh, that invited us in. In any case, we, uh, we performed five times. We came once a week uh, into the prison and it just so happened that the, the four actors uh, who were uh, in the company and coming in and uh, playing back the um, the stories of the inmates uh, all happened to be women, and so the encounter uh, of doing doing playback theater, uh, where uh, the men felt uh, safe enough to share their personal stories in this fishbowl kind of uh, context, the jail, you know, with, um, with the guard, the guard station being in the middle of this big bowl. Uh, and so they're looking down on, on everyone. It's just a, an, uh, the impact and the relationship and the intimacy that, that was created was very profound. And that I saw the playback theater as a drama therapy intervention, uh, working with domestic uh, violence uh, with uh, incarcerated men uh, was a very powerful uh, intervention. It's a deeply uh, personal question uh, because um, that um, I think if you really look at the body of my work as a drama therapist, especially working with historical trauma, that uh, for me, Nazis were the, were the monsters of my childhood uh, uh, nightmares. Um, and although incarcerated people are not not Nazis, uh, but um, the the question of, of perpetration or the, you know, uh, the uh, how do you how do you tame this part of the human being, uh, and what are the roots of uh, of uh, behavior that uh, 
that that is dehumanizing. What are the what are the roots of racism, or you know, all the mechanisms that cause cause uh, people to um, harm a, another person. So uh, it's a larger question than just working with inmates. And um, and so I did. I've, I've, I went to Germany and I worked with uh, with um, actual. Uh, I mean, they're gone now, but people who had been in the German army or, or who actually were were uh, inducted into the um, into the SS. Uh, there were a couple of people who actually came to my workshops in Germany uh, who who were had been Nazis. That, uh, so, so these are questions that, that I think are, are probably irrelevant to what you're, you know, the topics that you're that you're you're presenting on at the conference. But that's really what drew me drew me in, and uh, um, and also I I see the the inmates as. Uh, I have enormous compassion uh, for, and um, uh, and also um, believe in um, in um, reparation. You know, how do you uh, when you've committed a, a a crime? How do you get yourself back? How do you get come back? into society and uh, finding uh, where you redeem yourself uh, how uh, and what are the what is the process of uh, forgiveness or apology uh, or reparation these are the questions i deal with in my work especially when when i'm working with two groups in conflict You know, I would have to come back uh, in terms of um, <clears throat> um, well, I th I think um, uh, I guess this uh, this uh, story of this man who killed three people um, and. Uh, the fact that my intervention, it was reported, uh, saved his life. I don't think, you know, saving a, a life, I don't know if you can call life imprisonment with the, without the possibility of parole, uh, saving one's life. But um, um, I think that stands out uh, for me. Um, there is... Um, There's another moment that I remember, you know, when I, I was at uh, California Institute of uh, Fontella, California Institute at, at Fontera, uh, working with the women, that there was a, a one point, the group of women that I was directing, you know, um, they started to get tired and they started to act out. And I had to, to make a firm intervention. And I asked them, I, I spoke to them and said, "Look, I I need your cooperation. We need to we need to focus here." I forget exactly what I said, but the comment was um, that somebody, uh, one of the women, uh, thanked me. They said, "That's the um, we've been yelled at a lot in in our lives." But that's the, the kind, the kindest yelling that I have ever experienced. That there was that I was setting a um, a limit, but I was doing it uh, in a human way, pleading for their their cooperation, and uh, that they heard me. They did, you know, a lot of these have. Uh, people are, who are incarcerated are, are often stuck in rebellious adolescence, uh, you know. So they could they could have acted out in that way, but the fact that they they um, 
they heard me and they understood they understood and accepted the boundary that I was setting. So it didn't, uh, it's not a success story in the way that you asked it, but it's, it's, an, it's an important moment in my, my mind and um, in my memory. These are short-term interventions. And I, I make a distinction as a drama therapist between touching people's lives and uh, changing people's lives. And so I think um, that with these kinds of interventions, it's hard to know uh, uh, because they're, they're short-term workshops. So they, there's a beginning, middle, and an end. I'm not working with them over time like I would work. Uh, I work with uh, clients in my practice or in other contexts where it's an ongoing relationship, uh, an ongoing therapeutic relationship. So I feel like I touch people's lives uh, and I'm hoping that with the ripple effect of uh, modeling authenticity, modeling uh, spontaneity, creativity and, and resourcefulness that uh, I, I'm hoping that uh, I've changed people's lives, uh, but I'm not there to witness it because uh, we have to leave the prison and leave them behind. I think um, there's a drama therapy for the inmates in a closed uh, in a closed group, uh, but the the devised theater, the therapeutic theater, the autobiographical therapeutic performance uh, and self-revelatory performance models uh, allow the public to see the prisoners and hear their stories and thus humanize them. Uh, I think it's the humanizing process that I think can help uh, the uh, people who are making policies to see the, see the people not as monsters, but as human beings. And um, and I think it can have an impact on policy in that way. It could be part of a, other kinds of initiatives. Uh, but uh, I can't think of uh, other ways off the top of my head uh, about how it can influence um, influence. Uh, uh, change and political change other than through through uh um you know then i might move to theater of the oppressed and uh legislative uh, theater uh, that's where i would uh, where i would move uh, from drama therapy to social activism Drama therapy is a narrative form and that the, um, the inmates have, uh, are living dysfunctional life scripts and that I see uh, therapy as uh, uncovering the um, the narrative that you're living at an, uh, unconsciously so that you can see uh, which ones are choices that you're making and which ones are compulsions that you are um, acting upon. Um, and ultimately I see a drama therapy and therapy as a uh, uh, changing the script, rescripting. So I think drama therapy has uh, uh, the power to engage uh, people at um, at a, a um, down to the nervous system, and so I think that um, 
that I think it's one of the most powerful interventions you can have uh, uh, to help uh, incarcerated people change their lives uh, and uh, make new choices. Uh, so I, I think the idea of a life script is a useful idea. Uh, so change the script uh, through drama therapy.